What up, Joe? Tom Hopkins. Welcome to another episode of 3520, a Detroit Piston original podcast. For you joining us for the first time, 35 represents the 35th anniversary of the 1989 Bad Boy Detroit Piston Championship team, and the 20 represents the 20th anniversary of the 2004 Going to Work NBA Champion Detroit Pistons. On this episode, we have the 10th pick of the 1993 NBA Draft, Lindsey Hunter from Jackson State University. Lindsey breaks down what it was like being mentored by Isaiah Thomas, and he tells us about that 2004 championship run that he played an integral piece with, with the hard-nosed defense and the grit and the grind that you've seen from that team. Stay tuned as we get into all these conversations with today's guest, Lindsey Hunter. Welcome to another episode of 3520, the Detroit Pistons original podcast. Today's guest was a key member in our 2004 NBA title run and championship. Originally drafted by the Detroit Pistons, had a couple of stints here and there. He just can't stay away from us. <laughs> He's back here again today, Lindsey Hunter. How you doing, man? What up, though, man? How you feeling, yeah. man? Doing good. Doing good. Glad to have you on the show. Uh, I usually start the show off by asking everyone, mm -hmm. where did it all start for you? Ooh, where did it all start? Where did it all start? <laughs> um, well, I think uh, people that are familiar with me know I, I was born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. Um, small town, mm -hmm. um, but uh, Mississippi was a hotbed for basketball, though. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, I think during my tenure growing up there, there were a lot of, of dynamic players um, that I came along with. Okay. Um, out of that class, I think out of my class in Mississippi, we had six pros, and five of us was six two and under. <laughs> so it was an amazing um, kind of experience. Um, you don't realize it when you're going through it, when you're coming up and, and competing against a lot of these guys, because we kind of grew up together and we kind of watched each other develop as as it, as time went went forward. Um, but then you look back and you realize how good those guys were. Like we had Chris Jackson, Latario Green, James Robinson. Um, we had some guys that were that's right, really, really good, good young players, uh -huh. and developed into all of us were pros. Okay, um, so it was a unique situation. It, it, it really kept me sharp. It kept me striving to get better because I saw I, I had to see those guys every single year, and uh, and you knew how good you know everybody. Chris was always our measuring stick. Right, we always. You know, we heard articles, it was articles in the paper about Chris. He was on the news every night doing something phenomenal. So you had no time, you know, growing up in Mississippi to kind of be complacent. Okay. You always had to be like working to get better. Okay. And that pushed us a lot. Okay. So when did you know that ball was for you? That, listen, I'm about to take this basketball thing and get busy with it. Well, I think during those times, because, you know, Chris was like the number one player in the country, okay. number one point guard in the country. And um, if you could compete against him, you're like, I must be okay. okay. You know, uh, not knowing how good, you know, back then you never knew. Cause I was never a kid that was ranked. I was never ranked. Really? No, no, I wasn't on anybody's top anything. Okay. Um, And so my journey was a little different. Um, But I, I, one thing that always resonated with me from my father was that the work ethic, like you have to work, like at anything you do, you have to work hard. And, and, and if this is something that, that you are passionate about and you put your all into it right. and regardless to the results, man, you'll be successful. And, and I've always, that has always stuck with me and I worked my butt off, man. I worked um, tirelessly to, to, to just get better at my craft. And um, I'll never forget Cause I tell kids all the time, cause you know, I mentor a lot of kids, mm -hmm. and everybody from middle school on up is worried about where they rank. Oh, I'm, I, I'm looking at other kids, and I'm like, dude, I was never ranked. <laughs> I said, but the most important time I was ranked is when, when the draft came, and I was the number 10th player in the country. I said, so all that stuff don't really matter. I mm -hmm. said, it, it, if you really are passionate and you care about the game, and I really genuinely had a love for the game. Like, right. I just love playing basketball. Right. And um, – I think that's kind of what drove me. Okay. And I really, really try to get players, young guys to understand. I'm All the young guys I mentor, I, I really like kids that 
Forget about all the accolades and things, especially at an early age, man. Just just work on your craft and try to get better. Got you. So you attended two HBCUs. Mm-hmm. You went to Arkansas State. Yep. And then you ended it at Jackson State. Right. What was that whole HBCU experience for you like? Well, for me, it was different because I grew up that way. Okay. You know, um, before I, shucks, bef- the, my first sporting event was an HBCU football game, mm-hmm. you know? And so that environment for me was second nature. I grew up in it. I loved it. I embraced it. Um, from a kid, that's the only place I wanted to go. Uh-huh. Like, you know, me going to a Jackson State, Mississippi Valley football game, watching Jerry Rice when I was a kid. Um, all those things influenced me and and just the culture of it. I just fell in love with it, man. It was nothing like it. It was, you know, running. Um, everybody would run to watch the bands at halftime, uh-huh. you know? Um, so that was kind of my upbringing, my life. and and. Um, when I was being recruited, I had several HBCU offers, and I ended up going with Dave Whitney, who was, you know, he's a Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the, you know, Basketball Hall of Fame as a coach. Uh-huh. And Coach Whitney and I grew very, very close, helped me with my development quite a bit. Um, I was freshman of the year, actually, my freshman year, and he actually was fired after that. And that's what led me to going to Jackson State. Uh-huh. And, uh, and it's funny because I didn't go to Jackson State necessarily to play at first. Okay. I just went to go to school because I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. And they end up getting a new coach, um, Andy Stoglin, mm-hmm. um, who was Nolan Richardson's best friend. They were kind of on that Nolan Richardson tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Coach Stoglin heard that I was at Jackson State and approached me and I told him, you know, go talk to my dad and see what happens. And um, he convinced my dad that this is the place to, that I needed to be. Mm-hmm. And it was the best thing that happened for me because he really helped me develop and um, man, we became a really, really good basketball team on him. Won two championships there. Um, man, just just a, a phenomenal experience for an HBCU. We were probably one of the toughest mid mid major HBCUs ever. Mm-hmm. You know, we compete. We beat. Um, we beat. Um, Would it be Connecticut at Connecticut? You know, we beat Tulane at Tulane, and they were top. 10, top 15 team. Uh-huh. So we were really, really competitive, a really, really good team. We played Kansas to a standstill. They were number two in the country. Mm-hmm. They, you know, barely beat us. So Coach Stogland did a wonderful job of developing me and developing that program. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was the best time of my life, man. It, it was priceless. Because mm-hmm. I was going to say, you know, just even recently with, with Coach Prime at Jackson State, mm-hmm. Jackson State was predominantly known as a football school, you right. know, with the great Walter Payton, right. Jackie Slater. Right. And it seemed when you went to Jackson State, it became more of a basketball school there too. So what kind of pressure was it on you to help turn Jackson State and get a little attention off the football and say, hey, you know what, we got a hoop squad here right, too. Right. I don't think we, we looked at it that way okay. because we were so, you know, football was has in the South, you know, football is king in the South. So oh, we yeah. embrace football as well. Um, but at HBCU, it's always room. When something is booming, everybody is, is going to be a part of it. Um, to the point where the band would come play at basketball games, uh-huh. you know? So we had that type of environment, <laughs> you know, and it was fun. Um, and we became, when we started winning, it was nothing like it. Like our, our games were sold out. Um, you know, people were coming from everywhere to watch, to watch, you know, us play. And right. um, even the football team, like we supported each other that mm-hmm. way. Um, and it, it was just a joy to be around. And it was, it was fun watching it and even watching, what uh what what Coach Prime was doing at Jackson State was fun to watch, fun to be a part of, um, and and man, it, it just it created so many memories for me, and it it created a um a proudness in me from where I came from and and the things that I accomplished from Jackson State. Right. Okay. Fast forward after basketball. I mean after college. Mm-hmm. Nineteen ninety three NBA draft. Pistons, right. Pistons has two picks in the nineteen ninety three NBA draft with the tenth pick. They pick you. Right. Where were you at on draft night? Well, I was here. <laughs> oh, so you already knew it. <laughs> well, well, it's it's a crazy story because I was I was in Detroit. Uh-huh. Um, because I I didn't want to come to the draft. I I, I fought hand and two for my agent. I was like, I don't want to be there. I want to be at home. Okay. I was like, just in case I don't get picked, I don't want to be sitting up there looking stupid. 
You know, because we've seen those, yeah. those horror stories. <laughs> yeah, where the guy just sitting there and he's just falling and falling. Yeah, remember Brady Quinn? Brady yes. Quinn was sitting up in there. He left. So yes. I was like, dude, I don't want to do that. And he was like, no, no, they invited you. So I said, that means nothing. I said, we've seen this. Uh -huh. So, um, and and the real crazy part before the draft, so I was supposed to work out for the Pistons. Okay. And because um, I worked out for like 10 teams. So I could go from eight to 21. So my range was crazy. Um, but the word was I was going to L.A. at 12. Clippers or Lakers? Lakers. Okay. So I was like, okay, I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can go to L.A. And the Pistons canceled my workout. So I was like, well, I guess I'm not going to. Because so the word was Detroit was going to take Allen Houston. Yeah. And um, it was going to take the big from Iowa State. What was his name? Oh, yeah. yeah. Or, uh, AC Law Earl or something like that. No, uh, what was it? AC Guyton like that? Not Guyton. Not no, Guyton. It was, no, it was AC AC Earl from Iowa. AC Earl, yeah. I, I, they were gonna take those two, so right. I was like, cool. I'll, I'll go. I'll go to LA. I'll give me a convertible. And, um, and then when um, before the draft, they had some type of uh, it was some type of um, function they had uh -huh. the, the night before. And Isaiah was speaking at the function. And I, I was invited to the function and I came and he called me over. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know, because I, I idolized Isaiah from of course. when I was a kid. He called me over and he was like, look, we're taking you at 10. <laughs> I was looking at him like, what? And I went and told my mom, I was like, Isaiah just told me they're taking me at 10. Like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. You know? You know, somehow Zeke always got his hands on something because <laughs> we talked to Rick before and Rick was like, when he got drafted, Isaiah called him the day, the day before and was like, hey, congratulations, you coming here. And they're like, huh, how did you even get my number? Yeah. Something about Zeke. Zeke. Zeke got that phone book. He got everything going. So when you heard when you heard with the 10th pick in the 1993 NBA draft, the Detroit Pistons select Lindsey Hunter, what was that moment like for you? Well, you know, it's, it's, I still didn't, like, I still didn't believe it because right. me and my mom and you know my but family. I told you, Lindsay. So know, it was you, done. Yeah, but you, you can know. you can write, you, you you can get the checks ready. Yeah, but you hear all types of crazy stuff going on. You know what right, I mean? Right, <laughs> so right. so I'm sitting there and um, my mom and my dad sit next to me and um, and the camera start moving and I'm like, nah, I'm going. Uh, we we going to L.A. You still thinking about that commercial? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, nah, we going to L.A. I'm not, I didn't even work out for these guys. So I'm right. like, we going to LA. So I, and the camera was like, no, nah, I think Detroit's going to take you. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. Then the camera zoomed in on us, which they do, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. They think whoever they think that guy, you know. And then when it finally happened, I was like, okay. <laughs> so, I'm coming to Detroit. So let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Is the NBA draft like the NFL draft where the coaches call you before they even make the pick or you just don't know? No, they don't call you. They probably would call me. Maybe they call my agent. My agent was sitting right there, so we didn't hear anything. Right. We just sat there, and when they called us, that's when it happened. Okay. So you, know? so you suited up, and they put you to work right away, right? <laughs> you played all 82 games. It wasn't no days <laughs> off. They saw right, you had right. the, 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 the youth and the spunk and the run and gun. They said, we're going to run this guy here. Well, I, I think, you know um, – during that time, man, Isaiah was really influential in helping me my my rookie year, man. He um he really was was like that voice in my ear telling me, you know, no, you can do this. Hey, you're this, you 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 know, mm -hmm. and that helped me a lot, you know. Um, and um, people don't understand. He really assisted me and Allen, mm -hmm. um, because he wanted to usher in that new that new era, and um. I think it, it, it really kind of hurt us when he left. And we were like, whoa. <laughs> what now? What's going on, right. you know? Um, but but he was very influential, man. And and, and um, my rookie, you know, I was second team all rookie team and all that stuff, made the rookie all-star game. And, and um, you know, everything was progressing the right way. Um, and I think that that really hurt me when he left, that, that kind of put a damper on how I thought things were going to go, mm -hmm. you know? So let me ask you this too. What was the most defining moment of your rookie season that stands out even to this day? You could be like, wow, I'm really in the league. I'm really, I'm really in the NBA. Um, well, honestly, man, walking in the locker room and seeing Isaiah and Joe, 
you know, it, it was like you thought you were dreaming because you used to be, I've watched these guys my whole life. I've I've been in the backyard after after the Pistons beat the Lakers in the finals and we out there talking about, hey man, did you see what Joe did and see what Isaiah did, you know? And it was so surreal for me because um, I was like, dang, pinch myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, is this real? And, and that for me was like, more so than than going out playing against other guys, I'm I'm sitting in the presence of people of guys that I was only dreaming about, you know, yeah. being around or being somewhat like, you know. Okay. So your first stint here lasted from '93 to 2000. Mm -hmm. What was it like when you found out you was traded to the Bucks? Um, is that when the business part kicked in? It was like, you know what, this is. Well, well, you know. I had a great relationship with Joe, so we talked about it, right? and 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 I felt like it was time for me to move on. That 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 was around the time when Grant the Grant Hill transition was starting to happen, right? Um, so I didn't want to sit around and be a part of something, you know, that they were starting from scratch. And um, and Joe and I talked about it, and and uh, you know, going to Milwaukee was good for me because it was a contending team. Uh -huh. Um, got me a little more experience. We went to the conference finals. Um. Really, really good team, super talented team, loaded. Um, so it was, it was good for me. It, it was good for me. I, I think um, it was business. You know, Joe and I were friends, so it, it wasn't like any animosity. It was like, hey, let's talk about it, see what's be best for you, uh -huh. and let's let's go from there. And that's what we did. So this is when business really gets spent around, right? So. We make a trade with the Raptors. We send Michael Curry there to get you back in 2003. <laughs> then you come back again for a little cup of coffee again. Right. Then we trade you to Boston in February 2004. You never played for them. No. But somehow we found a way to get you back here. You know, the good thing about that one, man, I was double dipping. I got two paychecks out of that deal. So it was kind of fun. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey. So that was cool for me. So... The year comes 2004. Mm -hmm. Explain to me what was that like for you, that whole championship run, the whole playoff run, everything. Because you was a part of a squad that had a strong starting five, but the next five off the bench was just as strong as well, too. And you, you, Mike James, Corliss, you, all you guys played an equal part in getting this. I think you guys pretty much came up with the term bench mob, really, because right. you guys came in and just kept applying pressure when the starting five couldn't do that. Right, and and, and the funny, the, the fun thing about it, we we played, we were different than, mm -hmm. than Chauncey and Rip, you know. We, you know, we picked up full court and we just, all right, we knew coming into the game, like we gonna totally destroy, wreck the game plan. Whatever the other team had in store, we gonna wreck it. And, and we did it every night. And, to the point where we were so confident in our ability to do that, no game plan bothered us. Like we we would go over scouting reports and we would look and go, oh no, they won't be able to do that. <laughs> and we would just wreck game plans. Right. And it was, I mean, that was probably the funnest thing that we ever did because Coach Brown really didn't have to coach us. We just went out and people, and I, we would laugh at people because they were like, oh, you know, the Pistons, they're, they're pressing. They're, we were like, I press and do. We just picking up full court man to man. We're turning you guys. We're running and jumping. Rip is reading the middle. I mean, we would just, you know, play basketball. It was basketball. Yes, yes. When did you feel like we really gonna do this? We really gonna have a parade downtown <laughs> Detroit? I think we, as a team, mm -hmm. we when we started rolling. Um, we all kind of felt like we had something special. Like we 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 knew defensively, we were like nobody in the league is doing what we're doing. Right. Nobody is as deep as we are. Like you know, we bringing five guys that were starters. We're mm -hmm. bringing five guys, you know. And um, I think the biggest moment, the biggest moment of that season was when we lost at home to New Jersey. Okay. And we were going back to Jersey for Game Seven. I think that was Game Seven in Jersey. Yeah. And. We weren't phased. Like, it was so cool. We we jumped on the plane, and we was like, man, we about to go pop these boys, and then we going to go ahead and, and handle our business. And, and, man, we went in there game seven, and was no doubt. Like, we, we never flinched. 
And that was just an example of how, man, how laser focused that team was. Right. I did, in, in any type of adversity, man, I'd take that team. Of course. Because it, it was just unflappable. Like, you could tell us the worst case scenario, like, oh, well, you guys, this, this, that, th th all these things are against you. Uh-huh. And that 4 team will stand there and look you in the eye and say, oh, don't worry, we got it. Right. And that was like probably the biggest moment to catapult us like everything else is easy. And I want to touch on that as well, too, because with the 89 Pistons and with the 4 Pistons, those two teams probably embody this city more than any other sports franchise that we have. Because in those two years, especially 04, we weren't even given a chance. Oh, y'all playing the Lakers, it's over. Y'all about to get swept, it's about to do that. <laughs> but it's typical industry talk, the way how they look at our city. Right. And we knew you guys had it. We didn't doubt it because we saw it all along. Right. And when you guys went in there and took it to them and you gave them what they call in the league a gentleman's sweep. Gentleman's sweep. So that just made us love this team and everybody a part of it because y'all was us meaning right. at the inner city right the neighborhoods right. everybody that never had a shot because they was from detroit or never had a chance to get looked at because they right. was from detroit right you guys went in there and i won't say you shocked the world but you guys didn't shock us right so when you went in there and you guys didn't have a doubt you didn't have a doubt but they was doubting you because everybody a lot of people thought we was going to get swept. Dude, everybody, everybody we talked to were like, they never gave us a chance. Right. They were like, Detroit might get one. And you could even look back on the, uh, the broadcast. They were like, eh, Detroit might get one. Um, but we were, it was me, Eldon Campbell. It was me, Eldon Campbell, Ben. It was a couple of us. We were sitting in the, we were sitting in the steam room. Mm -hmm. or the One of them saw the steam room. And we were just talking about it. This was before the series started. Mm -hmm. And we were like, man, we should sweep these dudes. And this is before anybody even talked about that. Okay. We was like, yeah, they shouldn't win a game. Like, they're not better than us. And we were like, they got, they got Kobe and Shaq. That's it. We win every other matchup. And we it proved to be true. Uh-huh. You know? And we felt like if Kobe gets 30, Shaq gets 30, we still cool. Yeah, because like I said earlier, the the games wasn't even over 80 or 90 points. So, but but that was uh that was a nod to y'all defense, man. Y'all, yeah. you know, that 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 was definitely happy. And it really pissed us off when Rick Fox said they were gonna celebrate in Detroit. I remember that. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Well, yeah. the right team celebrated in Detroit. <laughs> exactly. Let's just say that. Exactly. You had to, in that 04 season, you had to lock up and lock down some of the greatest guards <laughs> right. to ever play this game right who right. was let's say top five no particular order who was the top five hardest guards you ever had to guard in, um, your, career? in your career in career ooh, career. career career so you can go back you can go back to chris jackson this pro career or period well okay let's do <laughs> you got to break that down that's a lot of good players let's do pro okay let's do pro um, from day one, Lindsay, from day one, from 1993 to when you, whew. So, so I had to guard MJ several times. He would pick up basketball. Right. It just was nothing like that. <laughs> right, right. Like, to this day, and I tell young kids all the time, like, dude, I've guarded everybody in the world. I've guarded Bron, I've guarded Kobe, I've guarded, you name it, I've guarded them. MJ was just different. Okay. That was just different. That that was just a whole nother level of human being. <laughs> you know? <laughs> How was Cole? Cole was tough too. Cole was so see the difference in and people don't understand, like Michael probably was the most athletic two guard. Michael probably was the most athletic player. Because he had a forty eight inch vertical. Ooh. Michael had the highest vertical ever recorded in NBA history. You didn't Ooh. know that, did you? No. Yeah. Forty eight inches. Six six. So it was different. Vince Carter has like a 46, 44, something like that. Oh man. MJ had 48. So his athleticism was totally different. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just different. It was a different guard. Kobe wasn't as athletic, but Kobe was so polished. He was like, a student. Kobe had a counter for everything you did. Really? Oh yeah. I watched Kobe work out, so we were in Hawaii. Uh -huh. 
And um, I got my workout in because Phil Jackson didn't. We didn't really practice. We didn't mm -hmm. do much of nothing. So get get your own workout in. So I had finished my workout and I'm sitting in there icing and I'm watching Kobe come out to the floor, man. And Kobe starts his thing. So he starts getting into his little post moves, his mid post work. And Kobe left mid post for an hour, and he did the same footwork for an hour: pump fake. Inside reverse pivot, pump fake jump. I sat there for an hour and watched. And I asked one of his guys, I was like, dude, how long is he going to do this? Uh -huh. Oh, he was like, oh, he's going to be an hour here, an hour in that spot, an hour in that spot, and an hour there. So then we'll go back to the hotel. I was like, what? Uh -huh. So he was so, so methodical and just so polished. Footwork, on point, jump. I mean, everything. So he had a counter for everything. Mm, mm. And that was crazy to me. Right. Because, you know, I could guard I could guard anybody and know what their go to was. You know, I knew where to send them. He was one of those guys, man, that he felt like whatever you did, it didn't matter. Like I got something for it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that that made him a tough guard. Okay. And you, you got Brian early in his career. Yep. How was that? Brian was just a bull. Like you just didn't want to let him get downhill. Mm. You know? Bron didn't really, you know, Bron doesn't really have that post work like that. He just will bully you. If you let him, I always say, if, if he if he gets even with you, you're beat. Uh -huh. There's nothing you can do. If he gets you on his hip, even today, if he, if you watch him, he gets guys over here, it's a wrap. Like, he's going to get to the basket or make something happen. And and you just have to stay in front of him and make it tough. You know, as brilliant as he is, he, you know, Bron is probably one of the smartest players you've ever want to play against because he's going to make the right play. He know the rotations. He's he's you know, uh, I, that's what I love about you know him. Um, but he was tough guard too. But them other two were different, you know. And then Allen Iverson, of course. I forgot about AI. Yeah, man. And you had to <laughs> and you had to go up against J Kid. Yeah, but AI different than J Kid. Really? <laughs> Come on, man. J Kid cool. He could pass all that. I mean, I wouldn't bother. J Kid wasn't really. But Lindsay, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. You held your own against these guys. So. Oh, no doubt. No, no, you. No doubt. Now, nah, look, look. I'm, I'm never gonna admit that I couldn't guard anybody. Exactly. Except MJ. I'll admit that I couldn't guard MJ. The rest of them dudes I could guard. Okay. Kobe was different. Brown was just big, I and mean, that didn't really bother me. Right. Hey, I never stopped trying to score. Like this dude, and he never got tired. He, and you had to be alert. Like, some guys you could rest. Like, even Kobe. Kobe would take a break and then come. Hey, I never stopped moving. Never stopped going after the ball. All game long. <laughs> so he's the original Energizer Bunny. Dude, amazing. Okay. Dude, he's like 5'11", 160. But, and I would beat the crap out of him. Like, I physically would beat the crap out of AI. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. but he never stopped coming, man. And and we we really cool guy, right? You know, of course. Um, just a competitor, dude. This it's just amazing to watch how small he was and what he could do. Uh -huh. You know, um, I think that's four. Who's five? Who? I'm good with you four, <laughs> <laughs> because you know what comes after when people ask you that, right? What comes after that? Who is the greatest of all time? Oh, come on, man. MJ ain't even close. Not close? No, it's not close. Okay. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that. Because I, mean, I could it be close. It's not even close. You can make it close because you can say all these right. variables. Right. And, and for debate, that's fine, but it's not close. Okay. Well, I, I got it. I trust. love Bron. Because I love Bron because Bron played the right way, and I try to teach my young guys mm -hmm. play the right way. Mm -hmm. But MJ's just different, man. <laughs> I got to believe you. I mean, if, it's just if different. anybody got validation, it's you because you played against man. all of them. It's different. So after the playing career was 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 done, what made you get into coaching? The game. Okay. The game, man. I, I've, uh, I've always been a student of the game. I've always loved being around it um, and, and just being able to continue to, you know, give back to it. I love working with young guys, love teaching, you know, uh, trying to keep the game at a level that, you know, we feel like it, it should be at, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of times we hear about, you know, um, if you look at the NBA now, 
it's a totally different game than when I played. Right. Um, but that's okay. Um, I don't, I don't devalue the game or anything like that. Um, we realize it. it's it's got to be entertaining, mm -hmm. and, and 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 what people want to see, they want to see scoring. Mm -hmm. They want to see. That's why scoring is up so much now. Um, but I always, you know, there there'll always be negatives and positives when you tinker with the game. Of course. And so when when you start hearing people say, "Oh, the international basketball players have caught up with the NBA." Mm -hmm. Um it's not the fact that they've caught up with the NBA. When you change the rules and you make our game a different game, mm -hmm. international basketball never changed. Right. They they kept the physicality. You know, they kept all the things that used to be our game. Mm -hmm. So you can that's an equalizer. So when you when we we send our guys over there to play, yeah. It's a different game now. Absolutely. So and you can hear you hear uh, Luca talk about it. It's harder to score in international basketball than it is in the NBA. Mm -hmm. You don't get all the calls. You don't get all that other stuff. They get away with being physical. They're not calling that. So that's kind of the, the great equalizer, I call it. Not the fact that their guys have caught up with us. Mm -hmm. It's just the way they play is more physical, a little more demanding. And our guys, our game is a more free-flowing game, which is fun to watch still. Got you. What? Because I heard you talk about uh, the coach at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. And then I know you had LB here, and I know you had Phil. Out of all the coaches you had, what stood out, what teaching stood out the most to you that you still value to this day? Well, I, I think the most underrated thing um, about coaching and, and that I realized being around the great ones, man, is is like there's no secret formula. Like Coach Brown was a fundamental junkie. Right. He, he drilled fundamentals in us till the end like there were there was nothing special it was like no we're gonna stick to the fundamentals I remember one practice um we were working on um a pin down with Rip coming off a pin down okay and Rip come off the pin down the big show he dropped it to the other big layup and he kept doing it and then Rip did something different uh -huh. and Larry do a head gasket it's like why would you stop doing this basic thing why would you try to do something different it worked stick with the fundamentals and you know his our our mantra was play the right way right <laughs> right. So, right so he just ingrained that into us and man it makes a difference like we all were on that same page about hey we're gonna do things the right way mm -hmm. you know and, and i'm a big believer in if you do you do if you make the right simple play every time the spectacular always happens you you, you go out trying to be spectacular mm -hmm. that's when you look crazy so um, that was that stood out to me more than anything, and people always ask. I'm like, man, Larry Brown taught me that, you know, fundamental will always be the basis of basketball. Mm -hmm. and, and you see, most of the great guys are fundamentally flawless. Mm -hmm. That's how guys are so great. Okay. So where is home at for you these days? Because I know you came here as a youngster yep. in 1993, yeah. over 30 years now. Yes. Is Detroit still home for you? Definitely. Okay. I've been here. Um, Man, I never left, really. This has always been home base for me. Okay. Um, and, you know, I have what I call my extended family here. A lot of, of people that um, I consider, you know, close friends and family. And um, my kids were raised here. <laughs> and, and they love it here, so there's no reason to leave. I got you. So now you know we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the 04 championship. Yeah. So if we was to take an empty chest and bury it for us to open up in another 20 years, Ooh. what is the one thing, one, what is the contribution that Lindsey Hunter would want to put in that chest so when we open it back up in 20 more years, it could tell another story about you? Man, that's a good question. I don't think you could just put one thing for me. <laughs> tell, me tell me what you want to put in here. Um, I'd have to say shocks. To represent me, uh -huh. I, I would want like a pair of work boots in there to represent how hard I work. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, probably a diary with my jokes in it, because I keep it. I I, I, tell I heard it. about some of your jokes, man. I heard some about some of your jokes. <laughs> so I, those probably be the two biggest things that I would want people to know. Like, oh, he came to work every single day, mm -hmm. but he still had a sense of humor. Yeah, because I can imagine that locker room in 04, right? 
I mean, besides, you probably think you can imagine. <laughs> was it hard to get Ben to smile? No. Okay. Ben, like people, Ben is a a com a complex individual because people, if you like, if you don't know him. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> if I you know. don't know him, it's like ah, right, whatever. Yeah. But then when you get to know him, you're like, man, this dude crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he's, he's he's crazy, cool, great dude, man. Just, but our our, our locker room was full of dudes like that. Like our yeah. personalities were so crazy and so across the board that it all fit. It was like a bunch of brothers. Right. And nobody was afraid to say anything to anybody. Of course. And it was just, it was a great locker room, a great environment. Cause we just, you know, we lit in each other when we had to mm -hmm. and nobody took it personal. Mm -hmm. We just was like, man, whatever, you know, and we talked about it and we kept it moving. And I think that that was so instrumental in us being a great team because nobody really, you know, rip start acting crazy. I know, yeah. They were like, dude, what you doing? Like, dude, you taking the last five shots, you weren't open. Man, go sit down, you know? <laughs> right. And and it was it was just <laughs> great to be a part of something like that because those, those situations are very unique. They are. It's very unique. And that's something that lasts forever and that, and that makes the brotherhood strong 20 right. years later. Right. So this part of the segment is brought to you by Allegiant Air, Lancey. So Allegiant Air want to know, what are the three most essential items you have to carry with you when you're on a road trip? <sighs> three most essential items. Uh -huh. That's a must. It got to go in the bag. I'm not leaving without these three items. I mean, that's what you like, toothbrush and what you, stuff okay. like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got to have my, well, see, I got my, my, my vanity bag, so I have my toothbrush in there. Okay. I got my, um, of course, the the bare, you know, the essentials, the dealer and all that stuff, and my my cologne. I keep my cologne with me because I, I like to smell a little, you know, smell a little. So, what is your go-to fragrance? Uh, I don't really have a go-to because I'm see. So, I'm one of those dudes. I'm a country boy, right? You got you. So, I'm the type of guy that I smell something and go, "Oh, what's that?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, say, I like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it just blew my mind how much cologne costs these days. It just, that freaked me out, but. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It costs to smell good now, Lizzie. I know, it freaked me out, but I am I got over it. But I, I, and whatever, whatever I feel like sometimes, I guess. And I'm not a, because I'm, I'm, I'm so basic, dude. Mm -hmm. I'm just a basic country boy that, you know, that uh, worked his way up and, and was successful. And, and mm -hmm. I don't even take myself that serious, but. You know, I just right now, man, I'm enjoying life. Uh -huh. I'm um, coaching, mentoring kids. Um, my baby boy is a, a junior at, at Mercer, so I, I, I'm flying back and forth watching him play basketball. Okay. So I'm just uh, best of both worlds right now. Okay. I get to come here and work for the Pistons every now and then and call some games. Um, so I'm just living life and enjoying it. How do you like broadcasting? It's fun, man. Okay. It's fun. You know, I had a radio show once, and and that was the best because uh -huh. you really can be yourself. <laughs> yes, yes, you can be yourself, and, and I enjoy. It. I do. It's fun. I enjoy doing it. Okay, I enjoy doing it. It it seems like only yesterday, nineteen ninety three came around, man, and I I can speak from experience, and I can speak for the city of Detroit that we love you, man, and we glad you never left us. Appreciate that. I, we understand the business part, but we we also appreciate that you never left us and you always somewhere where we can lay hands on you and talk to you and handshake you and show you the love that you deserve and all that. So from the uh, people here in Detroit and the Detroit Pistons, I thank you for coming on this podcast today and talking with me. I appreciate you guys for having me, man. Appreciate, appreciate you. you. All right. What an episode. See, I told you it's nothing like going back down memory lane with an NBA champion. I appreciate Lindsey Hunter for stopping by and talking to us about that 04 championship. 3520, now on the Detroit Pistons Podcast Network. Also available on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple. And always remember, always, always, always Detroit basketball. <laughs> <laughs>